Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our discussion today, a chat with the Yale School of Management's Professor Will Getzman, joined by Justin Wilson and Renee Green, recent alum from the Yale School of Management class of 2021. Um, I'm very honored to be here with you today. My name is Alex Baran Priya. I am co-founder of Ivy Exec, um, and we're privileged to be hosting today's session. And before we uh, jump right in and, and have Wendy um, introduce our, our guests. Uh, we just want to briefly cover a few housekeeping items that, that we have for you as our attendees. First, all of you um, are in listen-only mode, but we do want this to be a healthy dialogue uh, amongst everyone that's here. So we would like to encourage you to engage in the session by asking questions through the questions box that you'll see on the control panel somewhere on your screen. Um, do send those questions along. Uh, we've allocated about 15, 20 minutes at the end of our one hour to cover as many of the questions as we possibly can. Uh, some of you may, may be wondering, will you have access to the discussion? Um, we are indeed recording our session today. Uh, so you can look forward to receiving a copy of the recording uh, via email in the in the days ahead. And so with that, it is my pleasure to pass it over to Wendy Sung, Assistant Dean of the MBA for Executives Program at the Yale School of Management to introduce our panelists today. Wendy? Thank you, Alex. And thank you to those who are joining us today for this webinar, which is sponsored by the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives Program. Um, as Alex said, my name is Wendy Sung and I serve as the Assistant Dean of the program. The MBA for Executives at the Yale School of Management is a program designed for mid-career working professionals in a variety of industries and functional areas. Along with a year of coursework in our integrated core curriculum, students have the opportunity to dive deeply into one of our three areas of focus, and those are asset management, healthcare, and sustainability. Our students complete the program over 22 months during which they attend class in person at Evans Hall, on the Yale University campus in New Haven, Connecticut, every other weekends on Friday and Saturday. They also can leverage our extended classroom technology to attend remotely when necessary. Class weekends include optional social activities to get to know the university and Saturday workshops to enhance their professional development delivered by top members across the Yale faculty. The program begins with a two-week residency period in July. Students study and travel internationally through a global network week, which is required. They start their second year with an additional week of residency. Throughout their two years, students participate in colloquia curated by our faculty directors, where leaders in business and academia share their experience, expertise, and insight. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our three speakers, um, starting with Professor Will Getzman, the Edwin J. Beinecke Professor of Finance and Management Studies and Director of the International Center for Finance at the Yale School of Management. He's also the Faculty Director for the Asset Management Area of Focus in the MBA for Executives Program. He's an expert in investments and his current research focuses on al alternative investing, factor investing, behavioral finance, and the art market. Professor Getzman has written and co-authored a number of books. Most recently, Money Changes Everything, How Finance Made Civilization Possible. In the EMBA program, Professor Getzman teaches a course on alternative investments. He is joined by two recent EMBA alums from the class of 2021. Renee Green is a vice president, investment grade credit trader at Goldman Sachs. Prior to working at Goldman Sachs, she served for six years active duty in the United States Army as a Korean cryptologic linguist. During her service, she led signals intelligence teams in South Korea and also served as a military language instructor, teaching Korean at the Defense Language Institute. At Goldman Sachs, she serves as the chief of staff of the Veterans Network Steering Committee, helping veterans explore transitions into the financial services industry mentors, community college students, and coaches interns. Renee served as an elected class advisor for the EMBA class of 2021 and was selected to serve as the graduate affiliate for Pauli Murray College at Yale, mentoring and supporting undergrads. Justin Wilson currently serves as managing director and president of I2E Management Company, or IMCI, an early stage VC headquartered in Oklahoma City. Prior to IMCI, 
Justin served as Director of Strategic Investments for Choctaw Global, where he helped design and build a private market investment portfolio that suited the investments and diversification goals of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Before that, he was a political appointee in President Obama's administration, where he served as advisor to the Special Trustee for American Indians. Justin is a proud member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and originally hails from the extremely rural town of Wright City and is active in expanding exposure, opportunity, and mentorship to rural and native youths. He currently lives in the Oklahoma City area with his wife and two very rambunctious toddlers. We are delighted to bring together Professor Getzman, Renee, and Justin for what is sure to be an engaging conversation. Thank you all for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for that that overly kind introduction, Wendy. Um, I would I would love to kick us off, uh, but want first just by thanking uh, the those attending for giving me the good excuse to have a family reunion with Dr. Getzman and Renee and and everyone. This is just so much fun to see everyone's face. Um, and unfortunately, I have to announce that Renee will be giving the rest of uh, the session in Korean uh, because she is capable of that as well found out in our class. But I, you know, to kick things off, uh, I thought that, you know, I was thinking about what, what are some of the things that I love the most about this program and what were the, some of the things that I benefited the most uh, by ha having exposure to Renee and, and Dr. Gatsman. Um, and, and one of my favorite facets of the program was indeed having um, world-class thought leaders as, as professors. I mean, it is difficult to overstate how valuable it was to me to not have just this caged curriculum, but have some of the most respected thinkers and, and kind of, uh, you know, brilliant academics in the world be able to integrate uh, strange times into the curriculum so that you, you can contextualize these things as they happen. Uh, obviously, we've had some strange times in the past couple of years, and so that was especially apropos. So let's let's. I'm going to ask Dr. Getzman this question. It's I, I feel like it can uh, it can elicit some of that dynamism. Um, and Dr. Getzman, for those of you who don't know, is not only an expert in modern finance, uh, but in the history uh, of the field as well. Uh, you know, last year, Dr. Getzman, you wrote a piece uh, about the stock market reeling as the pandemic, uh, you know, kind of really took hold. Uh, when you're thinking about the impact uh, and influence of COVID-19 on the world of finance. Um, where does this pandemic rank relative to the other you know, massive events of history um, in, in the way that it, it has or will impact the trajectory of the, the profession of finance? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, it's great to be back with both of you. Uh, we've had a lot of terrific uh, dialogue about uh, trends in finance and uh, both past uh, and present. Uh, so um, uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Um, so Justin, the question you asked is the question that uh, all people doing financial history get asked whenever there's some big shock. Uh, we want to use the uh, we want to use financial history to get sort of a measure of how big this event has been. And then how did the world recover from something of this magnitude? Um, I have to say that the, the more that we proceed, the more similar uh, this uh, COVID experience uh, looks to the uh, 1918 uh, to, to 1920 uh, influenza epidemic. Um, and um, there, um, you know, a couple of things were going on. There was a um, there was the end of the, the First World War um, and the pandemic and a sudden need to readjust the whole global economy. Um, and it threw the United States into a recession in, in, uh, in 1920 and 21 that was really deep. Um, and we, uh, we kind of ignored it when the Great um, Depression hit, but that was a really serious shock. Um, and at that time, um, uh, we didn't have the wisdom of loosening up the um, uh, the, the, the uh, purse strings at the government level, 
But when I look at what we've done over the last year, it, it really um, shows you how big a difference the, the government policy can make in terms of mitigating some of the worst effects on households and on businesses through some what we want to call easy money policy. So I think history provides not only just a measure, but maybe some guidelines about what to do and, and what not to do. And, and so I think our, um, our policymakers over the last year or two have really uh, used the historical experience uh, to adjust as best we can to this, this huge shock that we're going through. That, you know, kind of a thrilling concept, right? So the absolute value of the impact is still very high, but the perhaps the negative impact uh, is not quite as high as it could have been because we had that precedent. Well, yeah, when you look at, well, here we all were, we're all in our own spaces. We're all isolated. Every single family in the United States and actually the world has had to adjust, you know, physically, socially, and economically, and it's really a big difference uh, for all of us. And uh, so um, uh, it was the same thing in in that influenza uh, epidemic. People had to adjust to masks. They had to, um, you know, try and figure out how to make a living when the rules of engagement and and, and so forth changed. And um, so that's what we're all going through now. And and I think what we learned from that is. First of all, the bad times will pass, um, but uh, but but um, the shock to the household sector is pretty big, um, and uh, so you're right. Um, the, the economic shock uh, during the 2021 recession was really large. We could have experienced something of that magnitude. In fact, we sort of did, but the the adjustment that we have been able to make, I think, has made a positive difference and, and mitigated some of that uh, pain that our, you know, that our ancestors 100 years ago uh, were going through. So as a result of all the changes that we've seen to fiscal policy, what trends and innovations do you foresee post-pandemic kind of dominating the market? I mean, the market's a lot different than it was in 2019 and, and prior. So you know, can you give us some examples of where you saw the market going at that time and then, you know, what it looks like after the pandemic? Sure. Um, well, first of all, the bad news and the good news. I think that the 21st century is going to look a lot like the 20th century in terms of global economy, global political economy, and the kind of disruptions and and, and um, shocks that the, the 20th century had. So, I think um, we should learn from that and start to prepare ourselves uh, in many different dimensions. Um, you know, the 1920s uh, that came out of that um, recession is uh, really instructive because suddenly the world equity markets took off like a shot. And the 1920s were known for uh, a broad interest in the United States in investing in stocks and uh, people getting uh, giddy with, uh, with making a lot of money in a hurry. And, um, and then what we learned after that, after the, the party uh, was over for a while, we began to learn that investing in equities was long-term a really successful way to build wealth. And um, so, so that's, a, that's a lesson that um, is important because if we do see the kind of disruption that we saw a uh, hundred years ago um, and the decades of war and what have you, um, it's useful to know that investing in, in a diversified portfolio of stocks actually weathered a lot of those storms, at least from an economic perspective. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm both pessimistic and optimistic when it comes uh, to the investment climate. Uh, going forward, I think we know that, th that things work despite um, some of the bad times that we might see. So, uh, you know, I've never 
I've never bought a stock or bond professionally on behalf of another client in my entire life. Uh, so <laughs> I will uh, try to steer this definitely back into somewhere uh, that I'm comfortable and alternative uh, alternatives is that space. Um, so since you happen to teach the class on uh, alternative assets uh, and, and all, you know, alternative investment strategies, um, and since you in particular have uh, uh, an interest and in, in expertise in art as an asset class, uh, you know, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, so you know, last year and even now, uh, museums and galleries and art fairs around the world uh, were closed down. Um, which is obviously an incredible challenge for the world of art. Um, but so where do you know things stand now for art institutions and for um, how that might have impacted or, or will impact uh, institutional uptake of art as an as an investment vehicle? You know, uh, or you know, I, I remember you had a Liechtenstein painting or a pillow in your office uh, during <laughs> our class. Is, is it going to be an NFT now? Uh, is it, you know, how is these, uh, how is this going to evolve? Well, um, first, I don't think that art is a major investment class. So don't bet your house on buying uh, an NFT. Um, and uh, don't bet your client's money on a portfolio of paintings, except as a small part of the overall structure. So, uh, I'm not giving advice here, but uh, that, that that is as close to advice as I can get. Um, you know, this last couple of years in art has been a remarkable thing. Well, I mean, the investment side and the and the market side is interesting. All of a sudden, these um, big art fairs are no longer this movable feast where the the uh, the the one half of one percent um, followed each other around and and bought. Uh, contemporary paintings. Um, the art has really made a huge difference in the social change that um, that we've uh, witnessed uh, in the last couple of years. I mean, um, you sort of think about it that um, uh, one of the sparks of of uh, Black Lives Matter was um, the the uh, statues in the South, the kinetic the the Confederate statues. And the idea of the, this iconoclasticism of, of of pulling down these I I emblems from a from from a from a from a from a history that uh, that people were were clung to, and then um, replacing that that amazing mural of Black Lives Matter in Washington D.C. Uh, and this uh, amazing uh, cover of Time Magazine where uh, Titus Gaffar, who's also a Yale graduate, um, Yale School of Art, um, you know, um, created a new icon uh, for people. So, I mean, I see this, um, the social trends of the last uh, couple of years as being very closely tied to people's feelings about works of art and, and art as a way to organize people's um, uh, uh, actions and, um, and, and thoughts. So, um, you know the 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 art fairs and the the, the market kind of has has followed um, you know uh, has been behind uh, the real important uh, salient ways that art has affected us. Um, the newest trend uh, of the last year has been NFTs, which um, are non fungible tokens uh, that exist only uh, on the blockchain. Uh, and so uh, it, it presents an interesting problem to collectors and in the marketplace. How do you how do you collect and display and curate uh, these uh, these electronic things? Um, and why is it so exciting for people to actually own them as opposed to just look at them and and copy them and and, and put them on their website? So um, I'm just constantly fascinated by that domain uh, of uh, of society but also the fact that it has an economic value that seems to be far exceed its practical value i guess on, on that note in this market it's been very challenging for investors to find value and also at the same time mitigate against any kind of risk do you have any insights and in good diversification strategies outside of art where an investor could find some value and hedge their risk 
Um, Renee, I know you're asking that from the perspective of having to field clients' questions about these things all the time. I'm guessing that you have a have a strategy that probably is better than the one I could could imagine. I mean, um, you know, from the um, I don't think that there's any safe haven in the investment markets uh, anywhere. Um, but that, in some sense, is a good thing. The reason why um, we get returns from investing in risky things like uh, the stock market, which goes up and down so much over the course of the year, is that there's a risk premium. And so, um, you know, if you said, I'm only going to invest in stuff that's really, really, really safe, these days, the market doesn't pay you to do that. I mean, you look at uh, inflation protected securities and how much they pay you. It's like, I don't know whether it's nothing or negative numbers, but it's not a way to save for the long term. So it really is about what kind of risk your client um, can take um, and whether they're any better at it uh, whether there are any particular risk is something that they can absorb more than somebody else. That's where they're going to find relative value. Um, and, and some uh, some kinds of institutions um, uh, are better protected against uh, certain kinds of risks than others. Um, so um, I guess the answer is it sort of depends on the on the clients themselves um, how uh, how best to hedge against uh certain shocks um and uh, i'm tempted to say um get a phd and go into uh teaching at a school of management because i it, it's been um really um i'm really thankful that uh we've been able to weather uh this uh this shock as an institution so far I actually think uh, that's a, that's good advice, if, Renee. If you if you go get a PhD and and start teaching at a school of management, I'm signing up for your class. <laughs> I'm always oh, no. I'm always doing that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, uh, when ahead. we're you know, and you mentioned my clients, like my I trade in the credit market, so it's a little bit different. Um, and I'm not a portfolio manager, but one thing I'll say, and this represents strictly my own investment views, not the views of my employer, um, but <laughs> I try to, I have to say, and this is not investment advice, but my personal view for my own portfolio is taking, like you mentioned earlier, just long-term strategic positions. Where do I see the forward in different markets? And I try to couple my personal interests there. So in the military, I worked on a lot of satellite communications. So I'm very interested in satellites, you know, in the forward, a lot of things with space technology, because there'll be ups and downs, but in the long run, that's where, you know, I see the market going. So my you know discussions with friends is just really to take a long-term view and then don't stare at your account every day so you know <laughs> well justin i want to flip one to you uh you know we're, we're now that we're talking about the market we're at zero Wait, what's your opinion on the fed do you foresee uh, any rate action next year 2023 I, I think i think if i have to answer this everyone does uh but what are, <laughs> i don't know when you establish that rule but okay <laughs> this is a fun question. I, I love it because I'm at a, a niche little player in the private market in middle America, so no one truly cares what I think, uh, and I can speculate wildly uh, without there being, you know, I'm not going to move the market. Uh, but I, I think back to, you know, to, to flatly answer your question, you know, I don't like to avoid them. I, I think, of course, that we're going to see a rate hike. I, um, whether it'll happen in 22 or 23 is that, you know, some of the previous guidance uh, suggested, I, I don't know. But, um, you know, clearly there's going to have to be at some point uh, and you, you worry about if you're in a liquidity trap, you know, about those things. But I think back to our colloquium and uh, Dr. Getzman incorporated uh, Dr. Uh, English uh, a few times, uh, who's an absolute expert, he's a, you know, former in general at the Fed, I can't remember his exact title there, but um, he he talked about you know let's think you know beyond interest rates. Let's think about uh, those alternative um, those those alternative tools that the Fed, the Fed can use uh, to achieve uh, you know their desired outcome in in the economy, um, especially if 
uh, you know, I think back to like 2008 when um, Bernanke is in his way effectively begging Congress to take action, like give me some fiduciary support. Um, so now, you know, Jeremy Powell has a great deal of fiduciary or a, a fiscal support, um, but uh, you know, so now the market is, you know, it's it's a slightly different tool. And so will they attack it with just uh, you know, uh, kind of an interest rate strategy um, to hopefully, you know, they're, they're, uh, they don't seem to be worried about inflation, but who knows? Or will they, you know, use one of the alternative tools that we've seen, the, you know, kind of the brilliance of the QE, you know, QE strategy in 2008, or is there going to be something uh, new that, you know, we're not necessarily expecting, you know, that they can kind of pull out of their bag of tricks? What do you guys think? Well, Renee, uh, I'm, well, let me just say uh, very short, shortly, interest rates over the last 800 years have been steadily going down with a few jumps and blips, but we're living in a world where the time value of money is just not what it was over the, the course of modern um, history. Uh, what that means, um, uh, we can speculate. But um, but uh, whatever the Fed does in the short term, um, you can sort of count on us um, continuing this slide down in terms of the time value of money. Um, uh, uh, that, can, you know, like I said, it's been going for a long time. Do you know when you say that? Are you saying both the real interest rate or the nominal interest rate, or both? Well. You go back 800 years, you don't know what the inflation rate was. You kind of know from price of silver or gold or something like that. Um, but this is work that um, uh, I'm really quoting some work um, that um, a scholar here named Paul Schmelzing has written about. And that's my takeaway from, from his research. He dug into all, amazing archives all throughout uh, Europe. And, and um, so, um, you know, it's a perennial question that we have about how we connect the past and the future economically. And that's what interest rates are. That's all they are. They're a way of moving money backwards and forwards through time. Uh, and um, so, Renee, when you're, you're trading um, investable uh, securities, that really is what it is. You're, you're involved in, in um, swapping out the, 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 the present and the future. And somehow the low interest rates that we've been experiencing over time tell us something about how people think about uh, the future. Uh, so that, anyway, that's an academic perspective. I'm not trading the markets. Um, but, you know, I would love to ask you guys a question if I could. Um, and uh, me, it's about the SOM uh, mission. And, you know, I know both of you, because I remember talking to both of you when you first uh, came into the program, um, were attracted to the school because of its mission, which is business for society. And, um, you know, you've gone through the program and happy to hear if the program lived up to that um, mission. But I'm also curious about now that you're uh, through the program, or how are you taking that perspective forward? Um, you know, does it make any difference to you in your job? And, and uh, you know, I just love to hear your reflections back after uh, having chosen a program that's, that's about, um, it's about mission as much as it is about, um, uh, about uh, asset management. Yeah, I, th I think that um, a big, to your point, I think that the attractive feature for me, and I know Justin would agree, is that, you know, being productive in the economy and being an executive in business and, and you know running a nice p l and being a good steward of your neighbor are not mutually exclusive and I think that the most important feature of the program is is combining the two and showing us how you can add value to both the economy and both to you know those around you and you know in short I'll say that you know yes the program lived up to my expectations there was nothing surprising about it. I think everything that we were told is exactly how the, the program went. I particularly enjoyed reading specific case studies, um, which always added some kind of moral dilemma 
and um, presented real life uh, examples of executives facing, you know, maybe it could be bankruptcy versus, you know, doing what's right for the community. It could be the, uh, the lake uh, pollution example, it could be a lot of things, but these are things that actually have happened and will happen as we uh, progress in our careers. Um, so I think, you know, it's also made me very mindful of where I work and what we do in the community, um, which is extensive. And, you know, I think with social media now, people are seeing more of these things. But I think it's important to know how your work fits into the, the larger piece of the pie so you can be proud of it, not just because you're, you're good at your job, but you're effective in promoting, um, you know, the advancement of others. So I think that I'm very like being reflecting back some of these things you take for granted when you're in the program because you just assume this is normal and this is what we should be talking about. And then looking back, I realized it was a very unique experience that I'm very grateful for. Yeah, this is one of my favorite questions. And uh, Renee has ha heard me prattle on about this for hours on end. Uh, and so I, uh, I, you know, I love it. I love the opportunity to talk about it because, it, you know, in, in, vis-a-vis -vis Renee, I had a lot, I had a lot more of a hill to climb. <laughs> Renee came to this already a rock star. I needed, uh, I needed real change, uh, but I, and, and change is what I got, right? I, I, um, you know, I needed both hard skills, soft skills frameworks. You know, my, my background was in the biological sciences, not in finance, and I had pivoted to it later. Um, you know, to came to finance it through a circuitous route, as I like to say. Um, and so, you know, I came. You know, my idea about getting an MBA was not, you know, as aside, aside from a Yale MBA, uh, was about filling those those kind of what I perceived as kind of blind spots. And holes in in my mental frameworks in the way that I was approaching portfolio construction and execution, um, and and gain you know, uh, well one gain you know access to people like you, Dr. Getzman and and Renee um, that I got to learn uh, learned as much from Renee in the course of the program as uh, as I did most of my professors, um, but I you know when I think about why you know in addition to why an MBA for me. Why Yale? Um, I originally wasn't, you know, like Yale wasn't my goal. I, uh, my goal was a, a competitive school in the region, um, and I I kind of looked at Yale as 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 kind of a due diligence thing. You know, um, I'm I'm uh, my financial hero uh, is you know the late great uh, David Swenson, and I said, well, if Swenson's a Yaley, then I have to look into it <laughs> at least, and I subscribed to kind of the behavioral view, so you know it was worthwhile to check it out. And what I found whenever I came to visit and met with the admissions team and and kind of kind of got to know um, what what Yale is and what it stands for and the School of Management's mission, um, I, I I no longer wanted to go anywhere else. Um, and and it utterly changed my life. I, I can't quantify the difference in the way that I approach both investing and um, economics and kind of social change and 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 impact uh, whenever I measure now versus the way that I looked at at approaching those things two and a half years ago. Um, the, you know, it, it's about a fit and it's about a, um, a mission in life to be more than the bottom line, right? The bottom line is a false measurement of impact. It's a, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a nice, um, kind of easy way to measure things in near term. Um, it's, you know, but focusing exclusively on that is a is kind of a cop out for what you know is the true cost of doing business uh, if it's done appropriately, and that kind of universal focus on both business and society. How can we be successful while building the world uh, into a better place rather than maximizing for ourselves? Um, uh, yeah, it, it it was an absolute uh, change in in the entire way that I think. Sorry. You know, uh, there have been so. This is such a uh, an important topic that uh, business leaders are 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 pondering, and and not just about the trade off between um, economic profits and social profits, but really about how to manage in in a world where uh, you're aware that um, 
shareholders care about those issues as well as customers and stakeholders and so forth? And does it mean that we need a different uh, kind of business education? Those are the kinds of questions that my colleagues and I are are talking about all the time and and um, and building cases when we can find opportunities to to, to highlight those those um, those challenges. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, you know, you've been with the program for a number of years. You're a founding faculty director, um, you know, head the asset management area focus, you know, so you've literally taken an active role in building Yale, uh, the SOM and certainly the IMBA program to what it is. Um, you know, can you just kind of discuss a little bit about you know how you've guided helped guide that uh into into what i just described what was so attractive to me um but also just the strength of the asset management focus area in general you know why you know to our to those that are joining us and are interested in in you know maybe coming to yale um you know why is our program a good choice um uh, you know for those in finance uh, well, first, uh, the whole program, the asset management program, is a team. is It's a team effort. Um, you know, uh, we have a a diverse set of instructors. They have their own ideas. Uh, so really, it's more about putting together uh, 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 different people. Um, and uh, I think we've been really successful at at, at fielding a, a a great team. Um, some of them real thought leaders uh, in their field. Uh, John Macy, for example, teaches in our program. He's one of the real leaders in thinking through what's the role of the corporation uh, in, in society. Um, and so we're, we're really thrilled to have um, people like that um, step up. And they do so because they're interested in the program, uh, which is great. Uh, Jeffrey Garten, for example, is one of the real thought leaders about the big picture of the global economy and uh, includes the political side of things as well. And, you know, just published a great book about when when uh, the United States went off the gold standards, uh, which is uh, which is a good read. So anyway, uh, it really is a, a collection of, of wonderful colleagues and they are excited about teaching in the program and i think everybody listening can see why that is because we it's a two-way street we talk to each other a lot about what's going on when i say each other i mean students and faculty and uh so um it is far from a kind of a dry um you know uh memorization of uh formulas and facts um and we talk about, you know, how we can move things forward. Um, you know, what's the future uh, of, uh, of asset management? You know, another thing that's kind of interesting about the, the program is that it really only has three specializations. Um, there's sustainability, which is about um, sustaining the physical world we're in to a large extent going forward, you know. Uh, um, and then there's healthcare, which is about, you know, how do you sustain, you know, how do you make people's physical lives be better? And I sort of think about the asset management program as oriented towards the big picture of how do we save for the future for, uh, to make both of those other two um, kind of missions uh, uh, feasible. Um, you know, finance is really a set of tools um, that, um, uh, that we can use to mitigate big risks through, Renee, through diversification, which you brought up, um, and also move value into the future. So when we need it, it's going to be there. And so big picture, like we know building infrastructure makes can make people's lives better, um, but how do we build it? We have to issue debt and um, bring capital to focus now in order to, to, to make those uh, future um, values come true. So anyway, I sort of think that when you guys are um, are interacting with people from these uh, two other programs, what I see is lots of, of energy and people spotting common interests. And I think that's a little bit more 
productive in my mind, and you can tell me whether this is true, than a sort of um, a generalist MBA where people are thinking about MBA uh, uh, broadly as opposed to these these um, three different uh, mission-oriented uh, avocations. Justin, uh, to round it out, I'll put you on the spot. What was your favorite part of the program? Go. Oh my goodness, I, you, you know better than that, Renee. I uh, like <laughs> the, the uh, you know for me, you know I didn't need you know you know for, for what I felt like I needed to be successful um not not just have a, a way into the world of finance but to to be impactful and and do something new and big um I, whenever i began the program i was literally managing money for my people um as wendy said i'm a member of the tribe uh a Choctaw nation of oklahoma um, and i grew up very poor uh and if it weren't for that tribe i like there were days that i wouldn't have eaten uh as a child uh, and so the stakes were very high for me. It wasn't um, something that I did to try to rack up the high score. It was something that I did to create an impact for the people I care about the most. Uh, so for me, I wasn't looking for the field necessarily or the network necessarily or the professors necessarily. I needed the whole thing. And what I loved about the program, was I got the whole thing. Uh, I, I came away with this family of, of, in, of incredible relationships uh, with, of people that I don't have to wonder if they'll take my call, um, that I have the utmost respect. And I know that if I get their advice, that it, it matters and I can take it. Um, I got, you know, that thought leadership from not, uh, you know, whenever we're studying uh, the expected return on on venture capital, uh, maybe for the next 10 years rather than the last 10 years, I can still reference Dr. Getzman's academic, you know, his primary academic research. Uh, the, there wasn't just a, a single focus that Yale has to hang its hat on uh, you know, that's very brittle. It is a robust and dynamic aspect to the program. Um, was the thing I liked about it the most. What about you? What was the thing you liked about it the most? Well, after that beautiful answer, I will say working on our last entrepreneurship project <laughs> was a highlight. <laughs> I'll keep it simple. <laughs> oh, I think we're over. Hey, listeners, our last entrepreneurship project was uh, me just doing whatever Renee asked me to do. <laughs> <laughs> No, we had a good time on that, and we were able to kind of tie our, uh, we were both passionate about increasing financial literacy levels, so we were able to tie that into a project, which was a cool way to do, as you asked us before, how we can serve the mission while also, you know, you, using the skills from our focus area. And I'm so sorry to interrupt uh, this wonderful conversation, but we've had quite a few questions come in, and I thought I, this might be a good time for me to interject and uh, and ask you some of these questions from the audience. Um, Professor Getzman, you talked about art impacting social trends. Um, how do you think social trends will affect the financial markets in the future? Well, I think the social trends are already affecting um, the financial markets. What I see, the most common question that I get uh, as a as a uh, investments specialist is about um, ESG and um, you know how to take that into account in your investment uh, policy. We don't have a great one-line answer about how to do that. Uh, because there, you you have all sorts of duties to um, uh, to investors and uh, into society, um, but I think that that is um, uh, a, a a central issue um, that um, uh, that is that is shows you the relationship between uh, companies uh, and the broader. Um, social and environmental uh, context that, that they operate in. Thank you. Um, similar to sort of your, your mention of the ESG, and this is a perfect question for you as faculty director of the asset management area. Um, 
uh, how does the program address uh, topics uh, such as blockchain and cryptocurrency um, and uh, other new topics that may come up? Yes. Um, well, we are lucky um, in that we have a, uh, a faculty that is actively doing research on many of the new topics um, that are, are emerging, particularly things like, well, um, machine learning. Um, we, we have a, a, a faculty member, uh, Brian Kelly, who is sort of the, the leading expert on machine learning in, in finance. And uh, and he gets involved in um, in shaping conferences and and so forth um, as well as teaching. Um, but you know, it's really hard to have a curriculum that is um, that is fixed when the world of finance is moving so quickly. Um, so a lot of us really are uh, excited to just uh, learn as much as we can about the flow uh, of de of uh, decentralized finance and. And um, well, I'll give you another example. Um, one of our one of my colleagues, Gary Gorton, who is an expert on the financial crisis of 2008, um, he has a new class he's introduced uh, about money and the theory of money, and a lot of it is focused on cryptocurrency issues and what and can you have a stable coin and are the problems that emerge with cryptocurrencies different than the problems that emerged with um, the invention of, of, of uh, physical coinage, um, whatever, uh, 2,500 years ago. So, um, uh, you know, what we try as a faculty, that, that's why it's useful to have a research faculty. As a faculty, we try and uh, learn um, and study and, um, and discover things about um, the, um, uh, the frontiers of finance. My work currently, um, uh, one of the things I'm working on is the whole marketplace for NFTs. Um, who buys them? Uh, how did the marketplace emerge? Uh, is it a speculative marketplace that is attractive for investors? What do you do about liquidity? Um, all those things are, are really interesting from an economic point of view, but also from a practical point of view of, of investors thinking about, should I, should I jump into this? If so, how and, and why? And um, Professor Getzman, <clears throat> I know you, you curate uh, the colloquia for the area uh, uh, for the asset management area of focus. As these new topics come up, how do you sort of um, weave them into the colloquia? Well, the colloquiums are um, a series of uh, eight um, visits and uh, talks by thought leaders in the world of, of, of finance. And the principle behind the colloquia is to try and get multiple perspectives and life paths actually, uh, so that students can learn um, not so much just from a presentation or a lecture, but being able to, to ask questions and interact with, uh, with these thought leaders. And um, so uh, the, um, the, the goal is, um, diversity uh, to begin with, um, you know, the, the, the school's educational um, kind of curriculum is built around the idea that you have to be able to uh, take on multiple perspectives to solve any problem. So um, anyway, that's the, that's the beginning of it. Um, I also talk with, um, with students um, and they tell me, look, we need somebody in risk management. We'd like to hear from somebody uh, that uh, interacts with clients, you know, so we, we try and um, adapt that. And then um, um, anyway, it's uh, been a, um, an interesting um, uh, project to try and uh, assemble these, um, these speakers. Um, and um, you know, I would say we've done a, a, a pretty reasonable job and um, uh, we would like to have them come to campus when COVID allows, but um, we've also benefited from the fact that um, Zoom calls are easier um, for some of the people that we might not have been able to call on before. Justin, Renee, uh, any particular colloquial speaker that stood out for you or it was uh, um, it's very impactful for you. 
I, I, all of them. Uh, but like to <laughs> kind of fill on what you know and give Dr. Getzman some praise on that, right? Like, you know, you you mentioned uh, uh, you know crypto and its uh, and the emergence of that and, and how to how to treat that both from an economic and a practical perspective. And I remember like one of our first colloquial speakers was Alex Davinsky, um, who had taken at the time. Um, it, it was, as far as I can tell, the earliest true analytical and mathematical approach to what is the sizing and, and, and presence of that in an appropriately balanced institutional portfolio. Um, and I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I've just, uh, I, I've really not uh, taken the time to rigorously think about that. Like, what is the actual size that it should be given its historic volatility and, and things at the time? Uh, that was incredible, um, and I think another, uh, obviously Paul Valent, who is you know another hero of mine, um, and uh, as an example of the diverse perspectives, because not all of these were were perspectives that everyone shared in the class. Um, uh, Dr. You know, Scott Morton, who is an absolute dynamo, one of the most impressive human beings I've ever been in the presence of, um, gave some some. I would say hosted a battle uh, in the colloquia uh, about you know the you know the the value or you know the kind of questions or potential problems that could arise from common ownership as as you know massive indexers kind of start to control large increasingly large uh, massive swaths of the overall uh, equity ownership. Renee. Yeah, I thought I just like that it was all oh, very current. So to answer the question, as things are you know changing in the economy, colloquium changes right along with it. So I didn't really have one particular that stuck out. I just enjoyed the fact that the conversations were topical, and there were a couple of times that I actually sent out different market color and some notes just to like my supervisors just about how I'm viewing the market, and then using some of the insights that I got from class and the colloquium, which added value to me. So I don't really have one that sticks out particularly, but just the fact that it kept me current and made me sharper at work. And I could see that literally on the next Monday, that was kind of what I was looking for out of it. Thank you. Switching gears a little bit, there's been quite a few questions come in uh, uh, regarding sort of the wealth gap and, um, and uh, you know, things that we're seeing in the market uh, today with a lack of uh, financial stability uh, that many Americans face. Um, how does the program, or how do you all think about uh, how we should be addressing these, uh, especially for those who can't participate in the capital markets? Yeah, we, we like to think about this a lot. I don't want to cut anyone off, but I know that I, it came up a lot from professors bringing it up. And then Justin and I specifically brought it up a lot because we both engage in uh, volunteer work regarding financial literacy. And you know, this is just my personal view again, but I think that addressing the wealth gap, uh, the first step that seems to be overlooked often is providing people with the tools to make sound financial decisions. So there's all obviously a benefit to providing people with the resources and the means which are needed, but there seems to be, um, a blatant disregard for helping people understand how to make these decisions and, and to navigate the market when financial literacy itself is a tool that is often passed along just as the same as a trust fund or any other type of wealth the knowledge that's passed along and learned in the home is not shared widely amongst others. So, you know, I think that obviously there's a myriad of things that need to be done in order to address this problem, but one of them I believe wholeheartedly in mandatory financial literacy education so that when people are presented with the opportunity to make a decision, they make the right one. And the the, the project that uh, Justin and I mentioned, it actually wasn't even to address necessarily blatant low income issues. It's an issue that I bet most people on this call can resonate with and it's exorbitant cost of, of uh, student loan debt. And what that does to our generation who some will never get out of debt. They may hope to pay off their student loans when they retire. And how to make a decision like that at 17 or 18, when you literally have no idea about compound interest, when the average cost of any four-year institution is $125,000 a year, it, it's a very complex decision, which even parents of our, you know, for our generation, school didn't cost this when they went to school. So they're not even able to advise, even if they did pay for school themselves. So 
I think that on many levels, which is often overlooked, sometimes we look at the extremes, the ultra rich and the ultra poor, but what about those in the middle who still can't make good decisions and are trying to better themselves? So I think financial literacy training is one key component to a broader solution. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm so happy to hear you say that um, because, um, and I like the fact that it's couched in terms of a wealth gap as opposed to an income gap, because I think the accumulation of, a, of, of wealth allows um, you to weather storms like the COVID that we're going through. Um, I, I can get on a soapbox about this because you know, uh, we lend people money, uh, the society lends people money to buy a house by giving, by giving them a mortgage. But um, investing in diversified portfolios of equities is actually a much better way to save for the future than a house. So how come we can't be giving people uh, loans to invest long term for diversified equity portfolios? just the same way that we do for houses. So that would, you know, it's easy to tell people, save your save your money, save your money. But you know, if you're only able to save $5 a week, you're, you're not in the generation that's gonna be able to benefit from it in a big way. But, go, but helping people by giving them a nest egg that they, lending them a nest egg to then invest might be a way to kickstart um, some solutions that um, as you say, Renee, um, it's not just uh, people right at the margins of subsistence. We're talking about a huge middle class and not all of them have access or capabilities to invest in this equity risk premium concept. Um, but um, if we could make that happen, I think that we would, um, we'd be doing a huge service. I, so I'm, you know, I'm naturally kind of, uh, uh, you know, I get, I tend to err into phil, you know, philosophical, you know, high, you know, uh, flights of fancy if I don't uh, stop myself. But you know, and in this one way, um, you know, Re Renee and I ended up, we ended up getting grounded uh, really quickly, and we were we're so like-minded on these things. There is a marriage of kind of practical steps you take and bigger picture things. Unfortunately, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could just, you know, we, there's this lever of, of either policy or economics that we could pull that would fix this problem in, in just one activity, we could dust our hands off and walk on. I'm, I'm skeptical that that's gonna be a, that that's gonna be a possible solution. And so I think that we probably ought to look um, at, at what the actual solution is. And unfortunately, it's one that takes a while and is difficult and you have to keep doing it forever um, and it's education. I mean, Renee nailed it, right? You, and I don't mean education as this, you know, kind of traditional American construct of schooling. I mean, giving people the tools to make good decisions and to identify when they're making a decision, identify what, what is a good outcome? Like, how, you know, what are these tools? Why do you do them? Give them agency so that they care in knowing and understanding that. Um, that, you know, certainly some of, you know, this is perhaps indicative of, of the Yale education um, writ large. It is a marriage of, of human behavior, you know, finance, which is in many ways a symptom of human behavior, um, and, and policy. And there has to be a marriage of, of those and, and several other uh, perspectives to be able to tackle, you know, the problem. And there's not, there's just not a single elegant solution. It takes teaching a man to fish, uh, you know, and then, uh, and then, you know, giving him a poll. Thank you. So uh, as we come to the end of our time, this hour has just flown by. Um, I want to thank Professor Getzman, Renee, and Justin for sharing your time and insights. Um, it's been so much fun listening to you and seeing yeah, the wonderful you. rapport and camaraderie you know, that, uh, that continues. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand the session back to Alex. Thank you.
Thank you, Wendy, and, and and thank you so much for a lovely discussion, Professor Getzman and Justin and Renee. We're we're so appreciative of your time, and it was very clear to me from from listening to your insights, and I'm sure it's the same case for the attendees that we are in a rapidly changing environment, and innovations, particularly those in finance, will only continue to accelerate. And and with innovation come opportunities, and and you've given us a lot to think about as we go back to our current normal, I'll call it, <laughs> but we, we do appreciate on behalf of the, the Ivy Exec um, network and, and our organization and, and having you all come join us and, and sharing your perspectives. Um, I'd also like to thank all the attendees for, for joining us for today's discussion. You'll be getting a recording of our discussion in the coming days. And thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you.